reading today from Romans 14, 1 through 9. Accept anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat, and one who does not eat must not judge one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another's household servant? Before his own Lord, he stands or falls, and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. One person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one, of, let, let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day, observe it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat. And he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. I just want to hope that God speaks through Jason here tonight, and I hope that we can make it into the building for Easter and have a great service where we can fit everybody in the building. And I just want to thank God for everyone coming here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Damien. All right, so Romans 14. Oh, thank you, Grant. Romans chapter 14 is where we are. Damien read the first half of that text. We're going to try to knock out the entire chapter today. Uh, The title of the sermon is We Live and Die for the Lord. So if you haven't turned there, turn there now. Uh, while, while we're getting ready, we're about to jump in here, let me give you a couple, couple words about the building, a couple updates, what's going on. It is increasingly likely that our night of worship and our Sunday Easter service will be in the new building. It is increasingly likely that will be the case. I wish I could tell you that. It is 100% sure. Um, it is so much more likely now that we're not planning on two scenarios. We're planning on moving forward with a Friday night of worship and then the morning service, uh, Sunday morning service in the new building. But the, the issue is like inspections. And so we expect, Lord willing, to receive what is called a temporary certificate of occupancy uh, re- leading up to, to Easter weekend. Now, we could receive that like Wednesday, Thursday, or even Friday. So, so that's kind of where we are. Until we get that, we don't have permission from the city. And I would say we don't need permission, but we just preached about submitting to the government two weeks ago. <laughs> it's, it's like I timed that up really poorly. So... So we're going we're gonna to wait for permission, okay? Um, and uh, we're going to be light on our feet. We're going to be ready to go. Whatever happens, whatever happens, it's the Lord's will. We're working very hard towards that being the case. Uh, this Friday, we could use some, or this Thursday, we could use some help hanging these TVs to help us. Uh, we're saving some money by doing some of that ourselves. So you can see Josh Holcomb about that. You can see me. I can get you connected as well. But we're going to be light on our feet and ready to go. The chairs for the new auditorium, they were ordered in October. They're supposed to be here the first week of January. We were told last week it may be mid-April. Uh, but then this week we got an update saying, hey, it looks like they're going to be delivered Thursday before Good Friday. So <laughs> we're planning on that. And uh, we won't know for sure till you know, man, the day before, two days before. But we'll send out an all hands like we could use your help. Looks like they're coming Thursday. We need your help tomorrow. Help us unload these chairs and get them set up. They could be coming in Friday. They could also be coming in in April. We, you know, but right now they're telling us Thursday or Friday, right before Easter weekend. And so we'll need all the hands we can get to help us unload those and get them ready in the auditorium. And if they don't come in, we're going to figure it out. We'll either rent some chairs or we'll take all these over and add some more. We'll be light on our feet, like I said, but we definitely could use your help, and it's going to be fun either way. I mean, Easter weekend, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, a great night of worship that we love to do as a church every year, evening egg hunt with the kids, Easter morning, celebrating the risen Lord, celebrating Resurrection Sunday, and then celebrating with an ice cream truck afterwards. Whether we're here or over there, wherever we are, it'll be fun to do that as a church. That is what makes our time together so enjoyable and so fun is the fellowship that we have in Christ. Along with that, the entire month of April, then we plan to be celebrating the new building, celebrating our 178th anniversary. And so we will have this dedication of the the building on April 7th. Uh, And I'll talk more about that here in the next week or two. 
And then also April 14th is Meat Fest, and then the 21st, we have some of the DBU worship team leading us in worship. And so those are exciting things. Put them down in your calendar right now. Be here for this. We could use all the availability a couple different times in the next couple weeks, getting ready. But man, the strides they made in the building from last Sunday to now, it gives us a lot of hope, and we're, we're excited about it. In light of all that, in light of moving into the new building, uh, the elders, we'd like you to pray about with us about our greater things giving and our commitments to greater things, which is the capital campaign for the new building. Uh, um, all of our day-to-day operations, our missions, our ministries, all of those things are supported through the general fund. And in your bulletin at the bottom of the first page, on the inside of the bulletin, that tracks our general fund giving. That is what all of the operations of the church It's what keeps the lights on, it pays salaries, ministries, the missions that we give, the money that we support in church planting and things like that. All of that is through the general fund. The new building and it being built is being supported through greater things giving, and that's tracked at the top of the next page on your bulletin. So everything that's marked greater things goes towards the new building. And we're nearing, uh, we're, we're about like in the last quarter of the three-year campaign for greater things. It wraps up at the end of this year. And by the grace of God and thanks to your generosity, we've done very, very well with that. We are v- quite on track to wrap up with that. Every dollar we receive is a dollar, or for greater things, is a dollar that goes towards the, the new building. Either the expenses up front or part of the goal with greater things was to have enough cash on hand to pay the first couple years of mortgage payments that will begin later this year to pay them out of our greater things giving. And so we want you to pray about helping us meet that goal of $2.4 million. Like I said, we're, we're well on track for that. And we want to make April a, a month of emphasis for that since we'll be celebrating in the new building. Pray about what God would have you give to help us meet this goal, all of that cash on hand helps us pay those mortgage payments for the next couple of years as the church's budget grows and our, building, and, our, and our congregation grows and allows us to grow into those budget needs. So pray with us about that. Pray what you would give and pray, pray with us that God will provide. Okay, these are exciting times. It's exciting to be together as a church and to walk through this. These kind of things don't really happen very much anymore in the United States with churches that were our size six or seven years ago and what's, what's happening now. So it's exciting to be a part of that, and it's all of God, and it's all grace. And I'm excited to walk through that with you as a pastor. Uh, so Romans chapter 14, we're going to wrap up our study in Romans next week. So we have two weeks, including today, to finish up Romans. Chapters 12 through 15, they really form the last major section of the book of Romans. Chapter 16 is some final greetings from Paul. So chapters 12 through 15 is really the last major section, and it starts with chapter 12, verse 1, kind of a famous passage. Based on everything that Paul has said, based on the love of God, a God who is rich in mercy, based on the fact that that God sent his son so that sinners could have salvation, based on the fact that that God now promises that everything that happens in the life of a believer is for our good. It's not necessarily all for our enjoyment, but it's for our good. It is good for us based on that, based on a God who promises that no child of his will be left behind, that no child of his will ever be ripped away from his hands. Based on all that, Paul says, Romans chapter 12, present your body, Christian, and your mind as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So this last section is all about Christian living. Paul is calling us to sacrificial Christian living, body and mind. So these final chapters are all about what does that sacrificial living look like? It's one thing to say to present your body as a living sacrifice, but what does it mean to do that? What does it physically mean? What is Paul talking about? And these final chapters are all about that. Love your neighbor sacrificially. Honor those who rule over you in the government. And now in chapter 14, Paul turns the attention towards the local church, towards life together in the local assembly, okay? So this final section is all about sacrificial living in everyday life with the kinds of people that you deal with, first your neighbors, then your government, and now chapter 14, it's all about life inside the church, the local body of believers. Those in the church, as Damien read, those in the church that are both weak in the faith or newer in the faith or more immature in the faith and those who are strong in the faith. So now he gets to those kind of 
tricky disagreements between Christians. And in case you think anything's new about that, it's been going on since the church began. That's why he's writing chapter 14. Disagreements between Christians in a church, not over what we would call gospel issues, not over what we would call like eternal life and death issues, like who is Jesus, how is one saved, but disagreements over secondary things, and in some cases, like way, way secondary things, but for whatever reason, it seems like those are the things that divide us. Those are the things that cause us to to get upset and to separate. Again, I I want to emphasize, and I know we've done that a few times in this study, the entire New Testament, the entire New Testament assumes that you're part of a local church. It does. This chapter is about those disagreements within your assembly. People will say, like, well, let's talk about, like, the broad church, like the whole church. No, no, This this is about those disagreements primarily in your own church. It doesn't really matter what Joe Schmo thinks of you over in California. It's about the people you do life with every week, the people you show up with and share communion with. How do you, how do you deal with that when there's stuff that goes on during the week and, and there's stuff going on with kids and all sorts of things? How do you deal with that? The New Testament assumes that if you're a Christian, you're assembling together in a local church. Multiple New Testament books and numerous chapters speak to church life. So, so in essence, it's like find yourself a church and commit. It doesn't have to be this church. It is not like this is the only church that that is pleasing to God, not by any stretch of the imagination. But find yourself a church through thick and thin, through sickness and in health, as much as possible. If you make the mistake of posting anything about church on social media, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, but if you you post anything about church and gathering in the church, uh, inevitably... Somebody will pipe up and say, like, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, okay? Like, you don't have to do that. And while technically that is possible, you really ought to be quite worried about somebody who shows no desire to gather with the people of God. You cannot say, I love Jesus, but not his bride. It's not how that works. Now, there are some caveats to that, age and health situations, and and, and I think in some instances of severe abuse at the hands of people in the church. That's going to make that difficult. But short of those extreme examples, somebody's like, well, I love Jesus, but not his church. Like, warning, Will Rogers, warning. For those of you that watched Lost in Space back in the day, warning, okay? Like, we're not, like, we're not what you, you're not what you think you are. In the New Testament, Christians assembled together for word, for prayer, for communion, for baptism. Okay? You don't have to live in the same house as your wife, but if you don't keep showing up, there's probably a problem. Okay? Like that, and that's not original with me, but that, that's the same idea. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Technically, no, but man, there's some red flags. Okay? The New Testament assumes it. It assumes you're part of a church. So much of the instruction in the New Testament is about life and local assemblies among believers. And here in chapter 14, we have another example. So what I want to do is I want to read the first part of the text again, and I want to set the table with context, and then I want to make two observations. So look at chapter 4, verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But do not quarrel over opinions. Don't quarrel over them. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. And I want to stop there from the bottom of my pastoral heart and say, take that, vegetarians. Okay, take it. All right? Strong Christians eat the meat of the word, and then after church, they go to Hutchins Barbecue and eat the meat again. They get their gains in the gym, and they get their gains in the church, okay? And if you're with me, Dove Church, let me hear you say, preach on, preacher. That's right, amen, okay? I've been waiting, yeah, meat fest, exactly. I've been waiting months to get to this chapter. Donna Pope, who is a vegetarian, okay, great, good for her. She was reading Romans earlier. She's like, uh-oh, you're going to say something about this. I was like, you betcha. I've been waiting for months to get here, okay? Exciting stuff. That was all free. Now look at verse 3. Let not the one who eats meat despise the one who abstains. Let me stop again and say that verse isn't really important. It doesn't really apply <laughs> anymore, Okay. No, no, obviously, okay? Joking aside, Paul, he knows this all too well. He's like, hey, slow your roll there, Joey Chestnut. Like, let's slow down here. Look at verse 3. Let no one who eats, let not the one who eats meat despise the one who abstains, 
And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So, I mean, what is going on? Like, what is Paul talking about? And how does that apply to Christians living in the 21st century? Is this really about, like, the carnivore diet versus snappy salads? And the answer is no. Vegetarians rest easy. If you do that for health or dietary reasons or whatever, you're not his aim here. I do, I do want to say, though, I don't, I don't get the vegetarians that believe eating meat is murder, and then you eat plant-based meat because, like, it tastes close to murder. Like, I don't get how that, that one works, okay? And again, that's free, but that, that's the, this is not about, like, if you want to be a vegetarian, okay, if you're gluten-free, like, all, eat what you eat. Like, we're free in Christ, literally. It is not about that. And neither, neither are carnivores better than vegetarians. The issue here, all right, and this is the, the, we'll talk about the issue, and then we're going to give you two points. The issue is old covenant versus new covenant, okay? So let me give you some context. But we have to get into the weeds, and so I do need you to stay with me. This is really important. I think it'll help shed some light on some other things that people may ask you from time to time on the street or on social media. It's really important. But the issue is old covenant versus new covenant, um, about the Old Testament and the New Testament. So one of the tacks against Christianity is, listen, you pick and choose what you follow. And if that's actually true, shame on us if that's actually true. But one of the attacks against Christianity is you pick and choose. And so you say homosexuality is a sin because it's condemned in the Bible. It's condemned in places like the Old Testament law. And you say you're just following the Bible. But the Old Testament law also says don't eat shellfish. And, bro, I saw you, what the damage you did at Red Lobster. Okay, like I saw that. And so you're hypocritical. You're picking and choosing. Hey, why don't you follow that? Do you wear mixed garments or mixed fabrics? Because the Old Testament law forbids that. And so you say you're against homosexuality, right? But then you're wearing mixed fabrics. What's the deal? And so the issue is old covenant versus new covenant. Here's the next slide. I want you to think when you think of the Mosaic law, there's three categories, okay? Ceremonial, civil, and moral. Ceremonial, civil, and moral. And I want you to stay with me. This is really important, though, to help you. So the civil law, the first category of Old Testament Mosaic law, civil law was given for governing Israel as a nation. The Old Testament people of God, the nation of Israel, they were originally a theocracy. The civil portion of the law was given by God through Moses as their legal code. So all of the conduct regarding finances and conduct regarding war, even the slavery laws fall under this portion of civil law, okay? Israel was God's chosen people. They followed the civil category of law when they were a nation in the Old Testament. But today we are under the new covenant because of the cross of Jesus. God's people are not located in one country. God's people are not located now in one ethnicity. God's people are spread throughout the entire world. Gentiles, everyone not a Jew, every believer that is not a believing Jew, we have been grafted in, the Bible tells us. We spent time talking about this in Romans chapter 9. God's people now are throughout all the ethnicities. God's people now on earth are governed by the church under the new covenant. Jesus says this, and Paul repeats it. This is the new covenant in my blood. So the civil portion of the law ceased When Jesus came and died on the cross and he rose again, there is a new commandment. There is a a new covenant, okay? Next thing is, the next portion is ceremonial law. The ceremonial law dealt with the ways that Israel worshiped God, their tabernacle worship, their temple worship. It gave regulations for religious festivals. It gave regulations for what food they could eat and what they couldn't eat. Ceremonial uncleanness and ceremonial cleanness, different sacrifices, types of sacrifices, the frequency for those sacrifices. If you're reading your Bible through in the year, you're probably just getting through some of that right now. And you're like, man, this is tedious stuff. But it was the ceremonial law God gave through Moses to Israel for their worship in the tabernacle and the temple. But Christ came and he's the ultimate sacrifice. The Bible says no longer do we need to rely on the blood of bulls and goats or sheep. Once for all, Jesus is the the once for all sacrifice. It's the significance of when on the cross he says, it's finished. No more sacrifice is needed because Jesus has come and his blood has been shed for our sins and then he rose again and he defeated death. 
And now our bodies are the temple. And the Holy Spirit resides within. And Christ is our mediator. So the need for the ceremonial portion of the law, it ceased, it passed when Jesus died and rose again. It's why he said he came to fulfill the law in Matthew chapter 5. It's why when Jesus dies on the cross, the veil of the temple is torn in two. Now, practicing Jews still follow the ceremonial law. Why do they do that? Because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why. But Christians do. And a new covenant has come because of Jesus. So we don't follow the ceremonial law today or the civil law today because it's out of keeping with the times. That's not why we don't do it. We don't do it because Jesus fulfilled the law. And those two portions ceased when Jesus came and he died and he rose again. In fact, in Mark, Jesus affirms that now all food is lawful to eat. All of it. Imagine those Jews for the first time they got to taste bacon. I mean, man, they got to taste bacon. What have we been missing all our lives that got bacon for the first time? Jesus affirmed that. In Acts, God says it again through a vision to Peter. This is the new covenant. Everything that I've given is now lawful for you to eat. When Christ came, the ceremonial portion of the law and the civil portions of the law, they ceased. They were no longer were the people of God bound by these laws. Now that leaves us, of course, with the third category. We've talked about this when it comes to other areas. I'll spend just a minute on it. That's the moral law. The moral law is summed up in the Ten Commandments. It is the righteous standard tied to the character of God. So the moral law is eternal. It's timeless. It's without beginning and without ending. The moral law governs all of creation for all time, whether you believe in Jesus or not. One writer says it this way, the moral law is as eternal as God is. And, and it was written in stone to convey this truth. So while the civil law and the ceremonial law began at Mount Sinai, the the moral law didn't begin with Moses. It was never permissible to worship another God. There was never a time in the history of the world where God was like, hey, you can murder people, go for it. Like the moral law has always been in existence because it's always been tied to the character of God. It's never been permissible to steal to murder, to have sex with someone other than your spouse. And it never will be because it's contrary to the very character of God. It existed before the civil law and the ceremonial law, and and we still live by the moral law of God today. And this is why you can hold to a biblical ethic of sexuality in spite of changing times because the moral law of God has always been in effect. It is unchanging like God is. It has always been sin to have sex outside of marriage and the marriage between one man and one woman. It has always been sin to pursue same-sex relationships. And God reaffirms this moral law throughout the New Testament. Marriage is one man, one woman, Genesis to Revelation. And what you have in between there is a bunch of people being like, I think I got a better idea. That's what you have. Murder is sin, Genesis to Revelation. But the point, or the, but the ceremonial portion of the Mosaic Law and the civil portion, they were both temporary, and they're no longer binding. It's why you can enjoy all the, the shrimp and lobster you can with a clean conscience, and you can hold to a biblical sexual ethic. It's why we can absolutely fight against modern slavery without any hesitation and not be hypocritical in any way. And the issue in Romans 14 is about those ceremonial food laws and some some observances of of holy days. So most likely, there are some Jewish Christians who Paul describes as weak in the faith, young in the faith, immature in the faith, weak in the faith, and they just couldn't get to a point where they could eat all of the meat. They just couldn't bring themselves to do it. They couldn't get to the point where they could be free from marking every one of the, the holy days or observances They just couldn't go against their upbringing and go against their culture. And others, Gentiles and also some Jews like Paul, they could. Paul identifies himself with the strong Christians in this text. The strong Christians understood the old covenant had passed, that all food was lawful for them to eat now. And so they enjoyed it, but some could not. It wasn't a salvation issue for those who abstained. These weak in the faith were still in the faith. So this is different. I think this is different than what Paul's doing with in Galatians. Because Paul has much stronger words for the people in Galatians. What was happening in the book of Galatians? In Galatians, there was a faction who argued for Old Testament obedience that you must obey the Old Testament laws plus believe in Jesus to be a true Christian. 
I don't think that's the case here. Paul has much more here, like it's okay to disagree in Romans 14. And in Galatians, like he goes hard at them. Like he, he goes hard. Okay, so, so it doesn't appear to be the case. These people are in the faith. They do believe that Jesus is the once for all sacrifice. But they just couldn't, in their day-to-day life, they just couldn't open themselves up to try some bacon, to have some like bologna. Is bologna beef or pork? I don't even know what bologna is. It may be like a whole mixture of things, okay? The weak in the faith, they couldn't get over it. So you have here strong Christians wiping butter off their chins, eating a good Chicago-style hot dog, heading out after church to shuck me in South Lake, okay, having a good old time, which was fine. The problematic part, though, was that they were flaunting their freedom in front of these weaker in the faith. They were rubbing it in their faces. They were saying, come on, bro, grow up. Do it with us. What's your problem? So that's a problem. Also, you have those weak in the faith, these weaker Christians, despising them for their freedoms. Because these strong Christians, in their mind, weren't as dedicated to God as they were. And because they weren't as dedicated to God, they despised them. And that's why Paul says what he does in verses 1 through 4. Don't quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak eats only vegetables. They weren't in Jerusalem, so they were in Rome. So one of what, what, what I think what a lot of writers or commentators believe here is that some of these Jewish believers, they couldn't guarantee that the food was kosher. So because they couldn't guarantee that it was kosher, they just decided to eat vegetables, okay? Like, like Daniel did and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego did. They just decided to go ahead and eat vegetables because they couldn't guarantee that any of the food or meat they were getting was uh, pr- you know, properly taken care of. So look at verse 3. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. So the issue isn't carnivore versus vegetarian. You're free to eat what you want, truly. The issue was treatment of fellow Christians. The issue was disagreement over old covenant versus new covenant. And some weak in the faith, they just couldn't shake some of their old ways, not yet anyways. And yes, it's true, who the Son sets free is free indeed, but they couldn't bring themselves in a clear conscience to enjoy some of that freedom yet. So let's keep reading. Look at verse 4. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. For the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. But each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Your conscience is not the same thing as the Holy Spirit. And yet at the same time, the Bible tells us you should not do things that harm your conscience. And so you should wait to participate in something that maybe you're free to do until your conscience has fully come around to that. You've been convinced by the word and the wise counsel of others. That's what he's saying here. You should be fully convinced in your own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Verse 7. For none of us lives to himself. And none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and living again, uh, and lived again, that, we, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? Shame on you for that. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue confess to God. So then, verse 12, each of us will give an account of himself to God. So here's the first observation from this text. Like, slow your roll because we all, every Christian, we live and die to the Lord. So Paul starts here with this, like, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Now, I want to start with this. Paul is not forbidding any and all judgment. Because Romans 14 isn't written in a vacuum. We have the entire rest of the Bible that talks about when it's time to judge and the right kind of judgment. So Paul is not forbidding any and all types of judgment. In fact, he has called for quite a bit of judgment over who's in Christ and who isn't in Romans. The book of James, the thrust of it is about genuine faith. Examining your life and those around you to see if your life has the fruit of the faith that you testify to. 
In Revelation chapters 1 through 3, when, when uh, John is addressing the seven churches, right? Their major problem was that they weren't exercising good judgment, both in their doctrine and in their morality. That's the major kind of condemnation over and over again. Even the famous passage in Matthew 7 where everybody knows like the first three words, didn't Jesus say, judge not? No one ever reads beyond the first few words, but if you do, Jesus says, take the log out of your own eye first so you can see clearly to help your brother with that speck in his eye. So Jesus is not saying no judgment. He's saying the problem is you got a giant log in your eye, and instead of dealing with it, you're deflecting to somebody else. It reminds me of that great dad joke about the man with the wooden eye. You guys, you guys ready for this one? Okay. There was a man with a wooden eye. My dad used to tell this all the time. Man with a wooden eye, he was very sensitive about it, uh, and he was very lonely. So his friends set him up with a lady who had a giant nose, okay? And she was also very sensitive about her giant nose, and she was kind of worried about going on this date because it didn't pass the smell test, okay? So, you know, like, what's going to happen here? So the man, he picks her up for the date, and he says, I thought that you'd like to go get some ice cream. And she says, boy, would I, would I? And he goes, oh, yeah, big nose, big nose, okay? You guys are welcome to take that and use that when you get home, okay? Well, what's the whole point of that? The whole point of that is like, why are we pointing? We're deflecting, we're deflecting. That's the kind of judgment that Jesus is condemning in Matthew chapter 7. We're always deflecting away from our sins and our failures. We're all create, always creating like a new list of like who truly loves God, who truly knows the Bible. All of these types of things kind of hiding our wooden eyes. Ignore the log in my eye. I think I see a small piece of debris in yours. Let's go ahead and focus on that. So all of that to say, Romans chapter 14 is not a call to suspend all judgment. It's written within all of the Bible. So what is Paul saying? Well, if we read it, I think we can get the gist of it rather easily. Look at verse 4. It's before his own master that he stands or falls. Verse 6, the one who observes the day observes it in honor to the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor to the Lord and gives thanks to God. And the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks. So Paul sums up those weak in the faith and those strong in the faith here. They both are doing it to honor God. The one who eats and the one who doesn't, their motivation is the same. You both want the same thing, to honor God. You're on the same team. And so don't let the great accuser, the great divider, the father of lies, let something as simple as food or a holiday divide the church of God. That's what Paul's saying. The, the point is that both sides give thanks to God. And because both sides give thanks to God and want to honor God with their life, then there aren't both sides. There's just one side. And we live and die together for the Lord. Again, these are matters not over spiritual life and death. Well, what are spiritual life and death matters? The deity of Christ. Is Christ who he says he is? Has he always been the eternal son of God? The supremacy of Christ. Christ alone. Salvation by grace through faith alone. These are things that you must separate over. You cannot agree to disagree on these things. But eating pork or not, or observing a day in the liturgical calendar, that ain't it. And I think a great modern day example of festival observances like in here is Halloween. Many Christians go in their homes and don't come out on Halloween. They don't like the emphasis on spirits and witches, and they don't want to be part of that. And others believe, like every other day, it's a day the Lord has made, and what other people do has no power over them. And since their neighbors are out, they want to be out too. And Paul's words here are for both groups. Like both of you want to honor God. And if that's your motivation, and this is a freedom that the Bible doesn't speak clearly on, then you're free to disagree, and don't let that divide the church of God. So Christian liberty says, whether you participate or you abstain, both groups are doing so for the Lord, and so both groups ought to support each other. We live and we die to the Lord. And you can add to that all sorts of things that the Bible doesn't speak about, like tattoos or card games or movie theaters or music. And all of these things require wisdom and they require discernment. What modesty looks like for men and women is another one. Okay? Within local churches, there's going to be great differences. And that's okay. It's okay. In fact, one of the fruits of a strong church and a healthy church is that everyone doesn't look alike. 
that everyone doesn't dress alike or observe the same things. And one of the signs of a weaker church is everyone looks the very same way. It's all the Stepford wives. Or it's a one-issue church. And you know it's a one-issue church when you walk in and the first Sunday you hear about the issue. I'm telling you, that is the evidence of a church that's weak in the faith. Okay? The strength of a church is its diversity in these matters that are disputable. Look, I grew up in a very strict, fundamental Baptist upbringing. So we went to camp in the early 90s. And back in the early 90s, there was this, kids, I'm going to tell you, there's this, these rat tails. Rat tails were a thing, okay? Like you, you, you had your head kind of high and tight, but you kind of left a little bit right in the very back there. And rat tails were kind of a big thing. There was all sorts of wild stuff in the 80s and 90s. Our group chat was a party line. Like you, everybody got a landline and you called into the party line. That was your group chat, okay? And so at this camp was this rat tail wall. And so every boy that got saved, the first evidence of him getting saved was he let the youth pastor cut off his rat tail and they'd pin the rat tail to the wall. And they pinned it on the wall and like, another Christian, there's nine rat tails pinned on the wall. Christ did not save you so all of you could have the same haircut. That is not what Christianity looks like. Not at all. We're a homeschool church. We're a no Halloween church. We're a no pants on women church. We're a big beer church. Chad Taylor's like Googling beer church right now. What, is it, what does that look like? Well, you're a church that's defining yourself by something other than what the Bible says it should. And you're letting yourself divide or letting the body of Christ be divided over opinions. A really healthy church allows for freedom for Christians in these areas because the Bible does. A really healthy church dwells together in unity over the things that matter. I'm going to tell you that that's our aim here. I'm not saying we're there. I'm saying that's our aim. And that's why you will find people at the Dove from all different walks of life. I always love meeting with new people, talking about joining the church, and they're like, I don't know if this is okay here, or this thing's okay, or this. And it's like, no, no, you haven't been here long enough. Like, we, that stuff, did, I mean, I got opinions for you, but it's not anything about why we fellowship or join together in membership. It's not how it works here. You have people from all different walks of life and from a broad swath of Christendom as well. But because by the grace of God, we try to keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. That's the main thing. That's what unites us here. That's it. Not haircuts or clothing styles or secondary beliefs like that. That's what unites us. And our statement of faith is very short and very specific for this reason. Because we are not about turning out cookie-cutter Christians. We want Christians who live and die for the Lord who are all on mission together, regardless of whether you have a rat tail or not. Okay, that's what we want. Look at verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we're the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and he lived again, that he might be both Lord both of the dead and of the living. We live and die for the Lord, and Christ has set you free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Look at verse 10. Why do you pass then judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And that should be a sobering, humbling word to read. Okay, we don't receive the judgment of God. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. But every Christian will still stand before God. We will. As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. You are not your fellow church member's master. It is not for you to stalk their social media and police what they do. That's not your job. You haven't been given a special badge by God to judge them. It would be great if God did hand out those badges. I mean, it would be. I feel like I'd be really good at it, but I haven't been. How they use their freedom in Christ is not up to you or me ultimately. Is it wise to consult others? Absolutely. And we should do it more, honestly. Absolutely. But ultimately, leave their freedom to God because we live and we die to the Lord. All right, and we're going to give an account. Now, quickly, here is the last observation. So Paul, in the second half of chapter 14, is like, so listen. So walk in love and pursue peace. Okay, walk in love and pursue peace. He gives a word to those stronger in the faith who understand that they have these freedoms. But they were kind of flaunting these freedoms. Look at verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. 
It is true that all food is clean. But if you have some Christians weaker in the faith, who have not grown in this area, Paul says, whose conscience hasn't yet been shaped by the Holy Spirit in this area, don't use your freedom to force them to do something they believe is wrong. And don't use your freedom to cause them to stumble. Look at verse 15. If your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. You're not walking in love if you're hurting your brother in the local assembly. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. So grieve and stumble here is more than just like somebody else doesn't like it. That's not the level that Paul's talking about here. And again, the context is when the, within the local assembly. It's not talking about the opinions of people that we've never met somewhere out in the internet or somewhere else like that or Christians all over the world. But don't use your freedom to just use a great example. Don't use your freedom to have a glass of wine or a beer and then also then pressure your brother whose conscience hasn't got there yet. Don't do that. You flaunting your freedom like that isn't strong faith. It's actually weak faith. Don't do it. Or don't flaunt your freedom in front of a a fellow brother or sister in Christ who's a recovering alcoholic. Don't do that. Love them over over your freedom. That's what you do. God forbid that you would ever use your freedom to hinder the Christian walk of a brother or sister in the church. Paul says that kind of freedom ain't worth it. And you being the stronger Christian and the more mature Christian, you can abstain. You can put that freedom aside for the day or for the week or for that celebration You can to make sure that your brother and your sister in Christ is okay. That's what strong faith looks like. So walk in love and pursue peace. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So let us pursue for what makes peace and mutual upbuilding. What matters more than your freedom is that you walk in love and that you pursue peace. Verse 20, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. So don't flaunt your freedom in Christ at the expense of your brother. I think another great modern-day application of this is that you don't need to put all of your Christian freedoms on social media. You don't need to do it. You don't need to put it all out there and on your story. You can enjoy those things without flaunting them in the faces of younger brothers and sisters in Christ who may struggle or may not yet have consciences formed by that. It still counts even if you didn't post it. It's a great charge to us to stronger in the faith. Walk in love. Pursue peace. That's what Paul says to do. I want to finish with this example about destroying the work of God over food. A few years back, I went to Ghana, and I, I helped teach a one-week conference for uh, pastors in Ghana, and I went with uh, Jill's uh, father, Phil Knott, and uh, we got to see some of the wall, the wells that our church supports, Water for Christ, where they go into these villages that don't have water, they plant a church, and they also build a well, and that pastor and that church have immediate credibility in that village, so I got to see that and visit that, and we helped lead this week-long seminar And uh, we lived on the grounds of this empty seminary. And not many years earlier, it had been led by an American BMA missionary. And uh, but the ministry had kind of faltered and failed. And so now it sat empty. And Phil, if you've ever traveled with Phil to other countries, he is just such a the man. Just loves the work of God, and he's so at home in any culture, in any place. And I'm just trying to take my cues from him, and I do what he he does. And we all share the house with these 20 pastors. We live with them. We ate all of our meals together. In Ghana, shared community meals are a big thing. They're a huge deal. And a lot of the food I thought was very good. And I'm a bit of a foodie anyways, and not much offends me except for, you know, tuna casserole, right? That's about the only thing. And fortunately, they didn't have that. But there was this one thing there that was very difficult, and it was called fufu, and it was a mix of chicken and fish in this stew, and the stew itself was fermented. And so we're eating, and it's, it's a hot dining room, and there's like 20 of us around this table, you know, grabbing with our hands. And it was a lot, man. And I, I ate bowls. I ate bowls full by the grace of God because I'm just doing literally what Phil tells me to do. And what you find out is like these pastors, like they, their esteem of you and your ability to counsel them immediately goes up. They literally tell me like, other than Phil, no other white pastors ever eat with us. They don't eat with us. They just don't do it. They were convinced, the man that led the ministry there that had left, that he was a racist because he would never eat with them. 
But uh, talking with Phil, it wasn't the case. He was a picky eater. He could never bring himself to eat their kind of food. And it literally destroyed the ministry that he was working in because he couldn't get over his stomach. And it's like, bro, don't destroy the work of God over food. Man up, woman up and eat it. And in other situations, don't eat it. Don't let your freedom to cause someone else to stumble. We're missing it. Walk in love and pursue peace above everything else, above what we would prefer, above what we would even enjoy. Walk in love and pursue peace. May, may that be said of us to walk in love and to pursue peace because we, we all live and die for the Lord. And all of us are going to give an account one day before the Father. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. We thank you that Christ has made us free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Forgive us, Lord, for the way that we flaunt our freedoms. Forgive us for the way we despise someone else who uses their freedoms differently. Lord, that's sin, and it shouldn't be so in the body of Christ. Forgive us for that. Help us to be a church that's unified around Jesus, that celebrates the freedoms of others, united by the Word of God, on mission for Jesus Christ. The instruments are going to play, and maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. You've realized for the first time today that you don't know Christ as your Savior, that you need your sins forgiven. And so your prayer today is, Father, save me. Forgive me for my sins. Maybe you're here and you are a Christian, and God is showing you some ways that you have been wrongly judging your brother or sister in Christ. You've been policing things you don't need to police. You need to let that go. You confess that. Maybe you're here and God's showing you some ways that you've flaunted your freedom. You need to reconsider your ways. Confess that. Turn it over to the Lord. He is a God who is rich in mercy, who is full of forgiveness. As the instruments play. Here's your time to speak with God. in Jesus' great and glorious freedom, giving, sin, breaking name that we pray today. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to sing a worshipful response.